<laughs> yes, yes, yes. Hey, I am loving the song. The song is growing on me. I'm so excited. Oh, you're supposed to say something. Too late. Just keep going, buddy. <laughs> but look who showed up this time to, to do this. Yeah. Who's on there? You. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm here. Hey, listen, and you thought... I, I was so impressed with your, uh, you put me in an airplane flying to Africa last yeah. Monday. And I just need to update everybody that what ended up happening on that morning, I went to the airline front desk and I was denied entry to go to Africa because I needed a 72 hour COVID negative test. And mine was like a, a, a day too old. So I drove home, I rescheduled everything, and now I'm today, as we speak, today's show, I'm back in Washington, D.C. I got my a COVID test this morning, already got the results back. It's negative, and which is good. That's very good. And, uh, and I have the paperwork. So tomorrow morning, I will catch an airplane and go to Cameroon, Africa. So I get to be on the show today and and I really didn't go to Africa last week, but that was a cool little picture that you posted of me. So <laughs> Yeah, I did feel a little bit bad for biosecurity because I put that chicken in the plane with you. And you know, bringing a chicken from another country is probably a big no no. But <laughs> Actually, honestly, that's... without any oxygen, chicken probably wouldn't have made it anyway. But you know what else? It could be my emotional stability animal that I travel mm. with. People yeah. are using dogs and cats and and giraffes and whatever else. So I probably could have used a chicken. But hey, it's good to see you. So yeah. good to see you. We have a full program today. We do don't we? and it's, I'm excited because this is our first. And I probably shouldn't. I'm going to go to it already. Um, we have our first mailbag questions that we're here to answer today. So we've you know brought in some other people. We brought in Matt and. Um, Ed, Edgar, but this is the first time the audience is going to be able to ask their questions and we now, can hopefully now, do a real good quick job. mailbag. Yes. What that means is they went to the website and what's the name of our website again? Oh, I don't know. Responsible chicken breeding chicken breeding .com. Dot com. <laughs> and people are going and they're sending a message to us in the mailbag and we're replying to those and you yep. have three. We're hoping to answer three of those yeah. today. Yeah. At least two. We'll see At how long two. it takes. Yep. Yeah. Well, what's the first question? So, all right. Wait. First, I have to play my fancy song, Jim. Oh, okay. Because you Sorry. like the music. So, so hold on. I love the music. Listen to this. Here we go. <laughs> all right. So here's the first question for you, Jim. So... Um, Seth lives in a country with very few breeders of good quality buff Orpingtons, so he managed to import an amazing male from a top breeder in South Africa. And I should say that he lives in Zimbabwe. Um, yeah. He is happy with the quality of his new bird. It's got great type, nice and broad, good even buff coloring, and correct size and weight. Um, the cock is 18 months old, and he's had him for a few months now, but he does not seem to have any interest in mating his hens. He's right. tried him putting him within a different hands, but he still does not seem too interested. What can mm. he try to do to make him more interested? Well, first of all, you notice this. We are a, we're a global chicken show. <laughs> Here we are. We got guys reaching in, you know, from the continent where I'm getting ready to go to, but yeah. Zimbabwe is a long ways from where I'm going to be. But, you know, unfortunately this is Karen, uh, this is really a vigor issue. And you know, vigor means uh, ambition and, and testosterone in a male. Um, so, and the fact that he had it imported and he's probably got time and money invested in it and he loves the chicken. Um, but it is a vigor issue. I wonder, you know, uh, Mr. Seth, <laughs> one of the things, if you haven't tried this, Try and separate him from all the girls. Kind of make him mad. Make him have a little bit of a female craving. Um, have you tried that? I'm curious if you've tried that. This is all the information we have on him, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that would be a big thing. Oftentimes, when he, they lack vigor, if you pull them away, it could be um, uh, you might want to try um, 
giving him some a little up a little protein, but that probably is more connected to some infertility issues. So Karen, my, my number one recommendation would be do what you can to separate him and see if you could boost his desires a little bit. Does that make sense, Karen? It does. I won't. It, this is too hot of a potato, so I'm not going <laughs> to try to make jokes about it. So, um, but would there be any, if this truly, if he just truly did not have a good male, I know you want vigor, number one thing, honestly, in breeding, right? In selection, yeah. like above basically everything. But if he just, if he's put a lot into this, is there any way he could AI just this once? See how this well, do. you um, absolutely, and I'm not necessarily opposed to that yeah. AIing. Uh, I, I've artificially never done it. insemination. Yeah. yeah, and I've never done it, but a lot of chicken breeders do it. And you'd probably might want a YouTube and and uh, an artificial insemination video for chickens. We probably won't be doing that on the show. <laughs> no, we'll we'll aim for bigger. But I'm just trying to see if there's any way he can recover from where he's at right now. Yeah. If that could, uh, man, I I hope Seth, when you listen to this. Um, yeah. And it's uh, been might... a while since he sent it. So it's possible that, you know, see, it can be seasonal too. I don't know African seasons, but, yeah. um, well, it's you know. always hot. And, yeah. and here's another thing. That's a very, very good thing. Be, uh, observation because sometimes, I mean, if it's depending, I wonder if he got the, the bird from Eng, if it's an English type or American, because if it's English, that bird's loaded with feathers in Zimbabwe is constantly hot. You need to know that high temperatures and very hot weather will cause a male to be lazy. And so that could play a part in this. You are brilliant, Miss Karen. You are absolutely brilliant. All right. Well, on that note, let's stop there before we I say something <laughs> stupid. Um, so are you ready for the next one? Yeah, let's jump to question number two. Uh, go ahead. All right. So hi, Jim and Karen. Thank you very much for the time and effort you put into the weekly live streams. Let's just stop there. That's all he wanted to say. Oh, wait, no, there's more. Um, I have a question pertaining to the New Hampshire episode. He enjoyed the slides from with the data from Frank Reese Jr. outlining the difference in ages and dress weights he was able to produce with his New Hampshire breeding program. Is there any data available about the dressing percentages on New Hampshire or other heritage birds? It would be useful to convert those dressed weights into live weights to aid selection for breeding stock. That's just before you, just before you move on, I yep. just thought of something. Okay. And actually, uh, it was a comment made. The other thing, Seth, you might remember, and I realize we're on to the second question, but this is our show, and we have fun That's with it. Right. The bird could potentially be overweight. All right, if he's a big bird, and and our friend Jeff Maddox mentioned that, and that's a great. Uh, that's a great thought. So um, that's another thing he could check. But back to this, this whole, uh, what was, we showed a slide, right? There was a slide that yep. he, uh, yeah. This is the slide he's referencing. So. Yeah. So, so with this slide mm -hmm. and with your question, what was his, that gentleman's name? I have Nick, it right here. Nick. Nick. Yes, yes, yes. It could, um, it could not be a gentleman. I'm not familiar. So it could that's be true. a female. All right. Well, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just well. Nick. Yeah. Nick. All right, Nick. Uh, the other thing that I might mention here is we, um, to answer your question, Nick, we're excited to bring on a, uh, a great friend of ours. He was, uh, he's been involved with SPN for a while and um, we, um, he actually did a kind of a chicken trial back in 2015. And uh, we're going to bring him on. His name is Brant Bullock. And Brant is, um, uh, there he is. Hello, and everyone. On. And I'm Hallelujah. leaving you guys. <laughs> so, so uh, Brant, it is so good to see you. Thank you for, for joining us. And let me tell you a little bit more about Brant. I think we were discussing uh, prior to the show, I think we met either in 2013 or 2014 in Asheville, North Carolina at this cool conference called the Organic Grower School. And um, uh, we were uh, probably three or four years into Sustainable Poultry Network. And, and Brant took it on himself to do this chicken trial kind of grow out um, trial run with, uh, with a, a few different breeds and presented it at our national conference in 2015 and uh 
Brant lives in um, he lives in Piney Flats, Tennessee, and uh, it is so good to have you, man. Thanks for coming on. Great to be here. <laughs> so I'm going to just let you jump in and share your your presentation, Brant, and and I'll kind of stop along the way or interact. And so walk us through. This was um, it was funny. Another thing that he and I were talking about. He, you know, it's been six years since he did this, and um, he w- I said, what was it like reviewing all the data? And he's like, I remember it being a lot of work. <laughs> so um, the other thing I'll tell you before he jumps in is Brant and another guy named Mike Badger. We went to Cameroon together, I think 2016, wasn't it, Brant? Mm-hmm. Anyways, Karen's going to get on us here because we got a lot to talk about. So jump in. Walk through this, this your presentation and, and explain to us what you learned along the way with this. Go for it. Sure. And uh, Nick, I, I definitely understand your question. And so that's one reason we sort of went to this trial um, is to sort of see what was the representation of live weight compared to carcass weight. Um, so if, uh, you know, if you look at the next slide, you'll see in 2015, 2015, um, Actually, I had a a batch of about 100 birds that I was looking at, and we took um, six different breeds, and we raised them out from September 30th um, all the way to where they were processed, so June 12th through September 30th, so they were only um, about 15 weeks. I always rounded up to about 16, which is what I was shooting for, but uh, with all the time constraints, about 15 weeks old. So I'll sort of walk through, I've got some slides to show you um, what the live weight was compared to the carcass weight. I did take uh, about 20 of each breed. You'll see as with six breeds, it didn't equal exact in there, but uh, there was a few more of some than others. And some of the breeds I took a little bit further um, because they're breeds that I had um, and had excess of them. And so I ran those a little bit longer. So I'll show you a little bit of comparison to what you know, 15 weeks, five days, and 18 weeks sort of shows up. Um, It was summer, it was hot, and uh, just like the first question, when it's hot outside, um, things change a lot, um, especially for grow out. So as much as I tried to move them on pasture, um, there wasn't much pasture. So they were pretty much almost (laughs) confined because it didn't matter where I moved them to, there wasn't really any grass. Called dirt, Um, right? Yeah, yeah, and so, you know, fed them um, a high protein feed, um, which I feed all of my grow out birds. And a lot of that's due because I also have turkeys as well. And so um, a lot of my feed is higher protein. So they were grown out together, all the breeds, um, you know, so just for time and for just infrastructure, I didn't have to separate all them. So you'll see with some of the size differences, if you did this trial and you separated everything, you may get slightly different results, but in my experience, it's not going to be that big of a difference. So um, with that, Karen, if you want to go to the next slide there. So here's the New Hampshire slide that, uh, so when I took these birds, I took all of them to the processor at the same time. Um, I leave, uh, load them up at night and leave early in the morning and their first thing. Um, a lot less stress on the birds. Um, also, uh, their crops will be totally empty by that point. Um, so processing is, is, is much smoother that way. Um, I sort of averaged the birds out. I tried not to grab the highest weight birds, but at least the top five and average those out and pick them. That's where this came from, this data. So if you look there, we have two males and one female. Uh, most of us uh, raising uh, grow out birds were much more concerned about the male weight, but the female is a consideration too. And I was actually really impressed with the females just in the, the percentage that if you look at, um, it was actually pretty high. So to answer your question, Nick, if you look at this, you, if we're looking at, um, you know, Frank Reese Jr.'s slide of the broilers being three to three and a half pounds, um, in that range, this is your live weight was about 5.31, 5.4. So say in the, you know, at probably if you really were looking, the five to five and a half range would be where you would want to be. Um, so if you're looking for selection um, and you, you can sort of figure at this age, your five and a half pound birds going to be about a three and a half pound carcass. And your percentage on that's going to be about 63%. 
Now, if you look at the very bottom there, this is one of the breeds, um, the New Hampshire was, that I actually, I took out a little further. And so at 18 weeks, the live weight was 6.25 pounds, but if you look at the dress weight, was only 3.94. So really, and, and Karen reminded me when we were reviewing, when we sort of went through this and I did it, I was very wondering how much more time um, was it worth from 16 weeks to 18 weeks considering the feed consumption for the small amount of carcass um, gain. Now the percentages were the same, so you're getting a better carcass. So as long as your carcass looks good and, and um, then and your the target weight that you're shooting for, it, it worked out well. Um, so that'll give you a little bit more in that where you're looking in that broiler range is the slide from uh, Frank Reese Jr. that you know, in that beginning of the bro of the of the, the the rooster at the very end of the broiler stage, you're looking at about um, a six point two five to six and a half pound bird in live weight to get to be about a four pound dressed weight. Yeah. Now, Brant, let me jump in here because here's the other thing, Nick, that I want you to remember. And and you know, our show is called Responsible Chicken Breeding. And and one of the things he did this in 2015. Now, um, if if Brant or any of us are breeding New Hampshires and we want to increase the size of the carcass, it's all that is we're able to do that. You may look at these percentages or or excuse me, the pounds and the size and go, well, I want it a little bigger or I want it a little smaller, but probably in this case, a little bit bigger. You can actually do that each generation that you are breeding by selecting, tracking the growth of the birds and their, and their, their weight gain. And each generation, you're selecting a larger bird and you can actually increase the size of the carcass. And that was one of the things that we were really trying to aim for, weren't we, Bran, as we continued to improve the New Hampshire and uh but you had only had these for a couple of years so if he if you if you slash I slash us continued those carcasses could be bigger um in 2021 correct correct and I I, yeah, I was breeding for carcass size but also there was a lot of other characteristics in the birds that I was breeding that I was looking for so I would sometimes disqualify the heaviest bird due to character traits and so I was not shooting just for. Right. Um, and so that's a good point, Jim. Yeah, and that's awesome. I'm glad you're uh, not just caring about weight. You're caring about the whole package. Mm -hmm. yeah. Brilliant. Cool. Cool. So uh, were you done on this one? So, yeah, I think so, Nick. That sort of gives you on the New Hampshire, you know, that so when you were asking about the slide there, the three to three and a half pound um, dress weight, what would your live weight be? Answer would be in the five to five and a half pound live weight. So that's but, sort of on the New Hampshire side. Now, luckily I also um, could acquire some other breeds that I didn't breed and ran the same test. And so we'll sort of jump through those. We won't spend as much time on that, but we will jump through those a little bit more. So we also did the Australorps, black Australorps. And you can look at those. They actually had a really good percentage, um, a little bit smaller bird um, than the New Hampshire, at least at that age. Um, but they were at live weight, they were right on five pounds. Um, and then the, if you look, I, I picked a couple that were a little bit different. That's supposed to be on the one there's a, a 3.6. I've got, I made an error on that. But you're looking at about a 3.25, 3. you know, five pound um, carcass off of a five pound um, bird, live bird there. Um, and females were actually pretty good, too. Um, they were four pound female was about a three pound, um, you know, carcass on there. So that gives you for the black Australorps. And then we sort of uh, move on a little bit. I, I have a question. question. Yep. Just uh, you as a, as a You're farmer. You're allowed to ask. I'm glad. Um, this information about dressed weight percentages is available for commercial, for Cornish Cross, for Freedom Rangers, for like birds that are farmed regularly for meat right is that a number that is published that you were oh yeah know? oh yeah yeah i mean i just the, felt the, like we could never answer this question for heritage birds which is what brant was trying to but i just didn't know what percentage a uh 
a, a, a commercial mix would be. Um, if yeah, I don't know those percentages, but what the, the, you know, even the Cornish cross, the freedom Rangers, those, those producers, they, I mean, and, and, Mike and Appa's done that over and over and over again. They are, they can give you the percentages to the to the exact. I mean, feed consumption and everything. And that's one of the things that I love about this work that that Brant did because, you know, you don't find this very often. Now, I'm always very very cautious to remind people there is a there is a study out there comparing Delawares to Cornish Cross, but and it's not it really just shreds the quality of the Delaware. But you got to remember this. People, this happened for years since we started SPN USA, is they, they read the Delaware statistics of, of bad genetics, bad Delawares. And, and so everyone says, well, a Delaware is a bad meat bird because we saw this one study. Well, the genetics will vary based on the breeder. And so you got to be really, really careful. So if you like the statistics that that Brant's doing, then you'd say, well, I want to get some, I like that New Hampshire size. So I'm going to get those birds. I'm going to get some of those breeding genetics from Brant. So sorry, are you? Well, I'm, I interrupted too. So we'll leave Brant alone. That's, that's good. I got to, I got to, that's a good, good point, Jim. Something else too for Nick to realize, especially if you're in the responsible breeding and you're breeding your own birds, that's not always the same live weight to dress weight. Um, you know, feathers are protein, they have mass to them. And so you can have a lot of things that, you know, birds, your birds could actually weigh more live and actually dress lighter, depending on, like you said, Jim, you know, due to your, your breeding and how your, your, your feed consumption, the time of year, there's a lot of variables in there, how much they feathered out and different things. So, if even your breed, you really need to get these numbers for your breed, and then you'll know for That's your right. breeding selection, what are you looking for? And so what you're saying is, if you have New Hampshire's, then this study of your New Hampshire's doesn't necessarily apply to another person's New Hampshire's because they're different genetics. Yeah. Same Correct. Breed. And they selected different things, you That's know, different exactly characteristics. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah, and Let's you can talk look. Bart. I wish I had eighteen week data for all of them. Um, you know, just time constraints and everything else. I wasn't able to, but like you can look at the Bard Plymouth Rocks. Um, you know, the male. There was, you know, in the in the variance there. You know, there was a, a really good. You look at a lighter bird. Actually, sometimes will have a higher percentage. So you can't look always at percentage either. If somebody says, well, my birds are a 70%. We'll see that with the corner, especially at 70%. Oh, that's the bird I want to raise out for me. Well, it, you need to look at your carcass weight and your live weight, sort of know what are you looking for? Because um, you can look here, it was only a three pound dress weight, even though it was a 68 percentage, 65, 68%. Um, now you go into the 18 week old birds because you're trying to get a larger carcass, say a four pound dress weight, you're only at a 60%. So the percentage really varies a little bit there too. And you, so you need to, to know that when you're looking for your selection, um, what, like Jim said, if you're wanting to breed for weight, you can add weight by selecting for that. Um, but as he said, and, and sort of for, for my end is I don't want to ever lose a lot of other things that I'm looking for too, just in the end goal for weight. So, yeah, that's great. That's great. So, uh, Let's see. I think you did another breed, didn't you? Yeah, we got the Buckeyes too. So I did did a batch of Buckeyes. Um, you can see the Buckeyes the there. The Ohio chicken. Yep. And they yeah. were actually, I was, I raised Buckeyes. I bred those for a little while myself. Um, so I really, you know, was always astounded at their, they had really good carcasses to them. They looked really good. They're really full when they were dressed. Because you have to remember that as well. We're looking at just weights here, not the presentation of the carcass. And if you're trying to raise these for meat and you may have a three pound carcass, but it's really skinny because it was a taller, longer bird because you selected for those things, then it may not be that that attractive at, say, the market or wherever you're trying to you know, sell it. So another good point. But they were really good. They were about you know, a little over four and a half pound birds and they dressed out a little over uh, you know, three, almost three and a quarter. So they, they did really well. Um, now, the next one, which will really show my percentage, is the Cornish. So, now these birds, which is very interesting when I look at the standard of a Cornish bird, 
But the live weight, they were only about four pounds. Um, but dress weight, they were almost three. And they really looked good. They, I mean, they were full carcasses. They were not skinny. The legs were filled out. They looked a lot better than a lot of the others, even at this age, uh, which is a little early in my aspect. I try to do 16 to 18 weeks was always my goal for, for taking birds to market. Yeah, and let me just clarify that. It's another thing, Brant, that, that Nick, you need to remember, and all of our listeners, birds, different breeds grow at different rate. They have a different growth rate. And a Cornish, and I mentioned this last week because the Cornish was our, our breed of, the, I think it was last week, a breed of the week. And, and you got to remember, a Cornish is a very slow growing bird. It actually doesn't, and it's a meat chicken, but it doesn't come into its prime until about the earliest 22 weeks and more like 24 to 26 weeks. And so he's, he's comparing, you know, this meat bird. He's processing it along with these other birds at the 16 to 18 week mark. So it would be, you know, it, it, it'd be a, a, a smaller bird. But um, anyways, that it, it just when you mention that, you know, you throw the dark Cornish in here, um, you, you got to remember, you don't say, well, Brant, Brant processed everything at 16 to 18 weeks. When you figure out what your favorite chicken is and if you're going to use for a, and try and uh, get it into the meat marketplace, you're going to want to look closely at what's the best age for that bird to be processed. So just a little side note there, Brant. No, that's a good point, Jim. And that sort of goes back to um, for Nick's question on the slide that Frank Reese Jr. did, because that was based on a New Hampshire. A slide for the dark corners would look different. The broiler range would be a different length of time for that range for what a broiler would be. It would not stop at 16 weeks. It would be on to like 24 probably. And so, yeah. you know, and you can sort of see that. So every breed is a little different in that range too. So just remember that as you're filtering this data through that original slide, that the, the length of time for these birds for when they develop fully will be a lot different um, just based on, on, on the characteristics of the bird. Now, speaking of, I think you did the Delaware too, didn't you? We did. We did the Delaware. Which, so this will go back to sort of where you were, Jim, on there. So um, the Delaware... It was, you know, it was a little bit all over the place, uh, but I had a pretty good, uh, I, I did about 21 of those birds. And I think in the majority of the tall, you know, say 10 of the males were in, you know, the four to five, five and a quarter, I think I had some. So they were, they were pretty, they, they were a little bit more variance than some of the others, but they, and they had a little bit more variance in the carcass. And you can see that like 4.56 in the live weight to a 2.8 and a five pound bird, only a half pound more is a 3.3. Uh, doesn't seem like a lot, but that's, you know, it's, it's a pretty good for his 3% of the birds ratio. So, you know, it, it, you know, I can see like you were saying, if you, you know, you can really look at these numbers and, and, you know, tear, say, Oh, they're nowhere comparatively. I would have loved to see the Delawares because I have raised those in the past out at 18 weeks. They would have been a little bit more substantial because I, I see the Delawares. I always saw them really in that 15 to 18 weeks. They really just were very good forage and feeders and really put on some extra weight in that range because they really probably are about a maturity. And you can see exactly where this is, Jim, but probably about 18 weeks is where I always thought of the Delaware, 16 to 18 weeks, about what the New Hampshire was for its maturity for a broiler. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yep. Uh, I think you explained it well there. Uh, Karen, anything you want to add here? This is the, the I'm curious, Brant, out of all these breeds, the Delaware, the Cornish, the Bard Rock, the Ostalorp, and the New Hamp, which one is just a little favoritism? Which one's your favorite? The New Hampshire. How come? <laughs> um, I've always loved the New Hampshire. Um, actually, I did the Buckeye a little bit. I love the temperament of the New Hampshire. Um, I love uh, it's it, it's just a, the consistency of it. In my region, it just does really well. Um, it's very good through, sometimes we'll have a hard winter here and there. It does very well through the winter. Um, just as your first question, it has really good vigor. Um, I don't have any problems with any any vigor in the New Hampshire. 
and I just I've always uh, sort of loved that breed. Uh, I think it also it, it's it's got a lot of uh, about my breed has a lot of good characteristics, but still I'm developing more and more as I go along. And so I always love that. And I think there's also a lack of good New Hampshire's out there. And so that was one of my passions is always to, you know, get some more out there. So did you bring up, uh, Karen, did you show that last slide uh, where we did the, we I will, I just, well, not only did I mess up, I also thought maybe we should thank Brant and say goodbye before I just, yank them off the screen without any <laughs> with any pomp and circumstance well with that i'm talking about that that new hamp dress carcass oh. was there any comments yeah. that yeah we're good he okay, brant did great. such a good job covering it i think it's there yeah hey brant uh that was incredibly helpful and and i trust that uh if if uh if nick's not watching he'll watch it later and we'll actually send him an email and say nick we answered your question from the mailbag and uh Brand, it's so good to see you, and I thank you again for the work that you did back in 2015, and and uh, looking forward to to reconnecting. Maybe we're going to be going to Africa again, Africa again, sometime soon. So, thanks for coming on the show. We got a ton of other things to do, so you have an awesome day. And and again, thank you for being a part of us today. Thank you, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Jim, and y'all have a great day. All right, see you, buddy. Um. All right. All right. We do have one more question. And I do think we have time. Uh, Matt's down there being very patient in the green room. Um, <laughs> He's backstage. So, all right. But this question is, is close and near and dear to my heart. So that's why I want to answer it. So, all right. So we have a question from Glenish Marsh. She I know Glenish. She is the yeah. coolest lady ever. I've yeah. been to her farm. Jim, I have to answer the question. Okay, but I like to tell one. I like to <laughs> greet our friends when they come on here. Um, she wants to know where she can purchase collapsible cages for temporary evaluations and selections. Um, she threw the number one answer straight into her question, Kuiper Cooping Company. Um, or, and so I think what she's really looking for is the or. Um, so uh, I, I am a huge proponent of getting selection cages. Um, I think it helps. I think it helps see the bird. I think getting them up off the ground and being able to see them. Now you have to look at them on the ground and how they move and all that too. But, but I like cages. Do you like selection cages? Or oh, it's very, very important. It's, um, it's the ideal way for us to be able to just like in this picture. Cool. There's old Craig Russell, man. I'm so glad you like pulled a picture out of the archive, yeah. but this is uh this is a selection time we did. Uh, with some red dorkings at a farm in North Carolina. But see, you can line the birds up and and they're up at a level where you can evaluate them. And and our next guest, Matt Hemmer, does this and Karen does this and others are really starting to catch on when we're doing selection, especially if I'm coaching and doing some mentoring and teaching people the whole selection process. So, um, oh, yeah, so Kuiper Cooping is the place that most people get their cages from. So that is the first answer that she put in her question. Um, there, uh, so there's their website and their phone number. Um, I have the number one poultry coops. Most of mine, I believe Matt uses the number two, which is a slightly probably would have been smarter way for me to go since my birds aren't in them for very long. So there's a whole list of different types they have though. So you can see those on their website. Um, yeah. And those are the best. Okay. I've been around Kuiper Cooping for 40 years and they're the best collapsible cages. You do, you do need the height, right? Oh, you so do. There's a Very whole bunch of phantom cages. So depending on your birds, make sure you let the birds stand naturally by getting ones that are tall enough. Yeah, you want to err on the side of the cages being too big rather than too small. Put a, a, a big bird in a small cage and it's hovering down and it's not going to you're not going to be able to select and and really get it to pose the way that you want it to so anyways uh so sweet we answered another question I, hold on i got more jim because she we can't answer the question with the question she asked that was already in there so oh, sorry i do have some of these and i've seen these before like collapsible wire products i bought some used and these were in there i honestly don't think they're still in business but there's a phone number that's on the cage itself if you want to give it a ring and I didn't do that part for them. Um, 
All right, but there are some other options out there if, if for some reason the Kuiper Coopings just don't work for you. I use from Wood Enterprises, I use the heavy duty pyramids. Um, those are my males out there. Just last week, whenever I clean their coops, I put them out. Um, yeah, so and I like those too. We made it. Yeah, so I like, the, you see on the slide, there's a heavy duty and a light duty. I have both. I much prefer the heavy duty ones because, you know, if you're going to spend the money, you might as well have not worry that your bird's about to get out once it's in there. So, but everybody's got different size birds. So that's another option you can do on the ground. Um, that same company, Wood Enterprises, sells uh, these stag breeding pens, which are actually a decent size and quite heavy. Um, so that's another way. They also sell square drop pens, which are not as sexy looking, but they have a top that half of it opens. So I, didn't know chick I didn't know chicken cages could be They sexy. can. They're so exciting. I get excited about the cage. <laughs> um, so, but that only half of the top opens at a time, so it's easier to get in and out. Um, and then ASI, you'll see these all over the place. So they, I think they make that light, that lightweight pyramid we talked about that I didn't mm -hmm. like as much, but still works. Um, but they also make these breeding pens. Um, they come in two sizes, um, 39 or 29 by 29 and 39 by 39. And you'll cool. find a lot of places that resell those. So if you're in California or in the Western Grange co-op actually carries them in Glenis person. is in beautiful Southern California. Yeah, so they actually sell them in their stores. Um, but there's a couple places you can order. So HP Cattle Supply, you can special order. And then I don't know who Judy Chicken is, but she's got a website and says they're ready to go. I'm guessing she uh, imported a bunch because I think you have to buy them in lots of a thousand or something. So she maybe wow. really wanted some and she's sharing the rest with the world. So wow. Um, so. That's You're it. talking a lot about cages. We got to jump into the breed of the week. I know, I know, but cages are so exciting. But anyway, okay. So, <laughs> so I'm going to actually put Matt on here for you first because I know you're going to want to catch up before you want to jump into the well summer. So I'm going to add him in and subtract me out, and then we'll get started. Sweet greetings, Matt. Hey, Jim. Thanks, How are Karen. You? <laughs> I'm doing well. Good. You're in a. a I've been to your place many times too. You're not down in that office dungeon where you're downstairs. You're upstairs where the sun can shine in through your windows. I'm upstairs in the in the sunroom where the uh, internet connection is a little stronger, so I don't uh, glitch out while, How we're, is uh, while we're talking. How is Kansas? It's weird as normal. Um, the weather is very unpredictable. Um, we've had some 80 plus degree weather so far and we're expecting snow tonight. Are you really? And so it's, uh, it's, if you don't like the weather here, wait 15 minutes and it'll change. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we got two days of really nasty weather and then it's going to be 80 degrees next week again. Yeah. So. Well, listen, if you uh, were a part of our show last week, you know, Matt was on and we did, uh, meet the breeder and Karen did an extensive time with you. And obviously uh, I was supposed to be on an airplane. And so I wasn't able to be live with you, but uh, Matt is um, I'm going to give another introduction. He's uh, a great friend. And, and he mentioned what, when did you, when did we connect an SPN? Did you figure out that year? 20? I think it's 14, 14? maybe 2015, maybe spring yeah. of 15. I'm not yeah. for sure. But uh, he graciously gave me the privilege of helping him to uh, do some selection and some coaching with him. And, and uh, I will tell too, I can't remember what year it was, but I did some house sitting for you too. And Melissa and I spent like a month at your house and I did some writing projects and, and was, uh, it was a great time hanging out at uh, Smoky Beach Ranch. I should have worn my Smoky Beach shirt today, but I didn't have it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're, uh, uh, I would love to talk about some other things, but we're talking well summers today, right? So we're jumping right. in. Karen's got a little, uh, uh, are we, you come. So let me say this before I kind of turn Matt loose on this. Um, I've never bred well summers. And, and over the years, as I've been doing selection or coming alongside of Matt and doing selection, I've actually learned a ton of stuff 
alongside of you, Matt, and we, we learned together. And in many ways, I mean, you, um, you, you probably know as much or more about these well summers than I do. And so um, I'm going to just kind of let you talk through this a little bit. And I'm going to stop you here and there and ask for some clarification or share some things that I've learned. And so jump in. Now, I can't remember. Did you say, no, I remember you saying last week, I've got four or five breeds and one of them needs to go, but I still love the well summers. So you still have some passion for them, don't you? Oh yeah. I love the well summers. They're a, they're a fun breed. Um, uh, they're easy handlers. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm a sucker for those dark brown eggs <laughs> and they're just, they're unique and different enough. And, uh, I really, I really enjoy the birds. Let's, uh, we can start with a little bit of background. Um, you know, the well summers are a Dutch breed. They, they, they take their name from the village of Wellsum where they originated. Um, they were a kind of a composite, a group of, uh, breeds that kind of put together to, uh, create kind of composite breed. And then in the 1920s, they decided what they, what they liked about, you know, these birds and decided to standardize them. Um, well, summers are really known for two specific things. And one you can see from the picture is the dark brown eggs. Uh, they, they lay a gorgeous egg. Uh, some of them are really dark brown. Others are a little a lighter brown, but with some really neat uh, speckles painted on them. Mm. Um, and the second thing is the iconic uh, Kellogg's cornflake rooster. You know, you think about the, uh, the well summer <laughs> males. Um, that's the, you know, that's people, people knew that as the chicken. That's right. They were on a cereal box, weren't they? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> those are, those are their two claims to fame, um, that, pe that people would know about. Um, they, they decided to get these, you know, historically they decided they really liked these, uh, birds and they really liked the, uh, dark brown egg color. And so they worked to standardize these, uh, they were admitted into the British standard in 1930. Um, they were shortly thereafter imported to the United States, but they didn't get into the U S standard until 1991. Yeah. And so the well summers are considered a, a light to medium weight breed. Um, the, you know, the, the cocks are seven pounds, the, the hens are six, um, with the cockerels being six and five, the, uh, they're a dual purpose breed. Uh, like a lot of dual purpose breeds, they are, uh, egg first. Um, the, you know, the egg production in these, I really feel like has some, has some awesome potential. Are they um, probably your best layers on the farm? They're not actually, but they're strong layers. Yeah. Um, I've had a pen go as high as 245 eggs in the pullet year with these. Although I think probably more standard is, is 225 yeah. on my who's farm, yeah. environmental conditions really weigh into that. Yeah. Who's your best layer on your farm? Well, my Erminettes are still okay. really strong layers and, okay. and they can, they can bounce in that 240 to 250 yeah. range. And, and since we're talking, consistently. when we're talking dual purpose, I mean, what's your, just your opinion and from the first part of our show, just your opinion of the well summer carcass what's it like well and talking yeah listening to brent brant that was uh that was pretty interesting um you know i do selection at at 16 weeks and uh my weights on my birds on my male birds like last year really ranged from four and a half to five pounds but i don't think that well summer male is ready for the slaughter for the freezer until probably 20 to 22 weeks. Right. Um, okay. That five pound bird at, at 16 weeks is still pretty angular. There's yeah. a lot of frame there, but yeah. there's not a lot of fill. Yeah. And uh, that, uh, that next four weeks, you know, really does a good job kind of rounding them out yeah. and getting them ready. So, you know, at, at 20, 22 weeks, they're going to be a little larger bird. And, you know, you're probably going to get closer to that four pound right. carcass. They're, a, you know, they're a bright, you can see by the feet of these birds are yellow skin birds. So you are going to get that, that, you know, good yellow carcass. Um, people like that for soups and stews and, and yeah. baked birds. Yeah. So, um, yeah, cool. Cool. Thanks for answering that question. 
And then, uh, you know, going through the birds, they are, uh, <clears throat> I think I'm, I'm reading off the uh, Sustainable Poultry Network uh, fact sheet, and we're talking about some common faults that show up in breeding these birds. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've got, you know, historically got some uh, narrow, uh, narrow bodies, a uh, little bit undersized, shallow breasts. Um, early on with my birds, I saw some of that. I've really kind of bred through them now that I've had these birds for about eight years. And so, um, some well, of the I, might, I might jump in here, Matt, because ahead, even, even these common faults, we did these fact sheets, um, several years ago. And one of the cool things that I think is so awesome about your commitment to breeding is that, um, if I remember correctly and you correct me if I'm wrong, we actually blended uh, seven, eight, or maybe a couple of years after. We blended some lines of well summers at your place. And so when we talk about these common faults, because of your commitment to selective breeding, birds are probably, they've drastically improved. Is it okay for me to say that? I mean, have you, you, you've seen improvements, I'm, I'm assuming. You know, I feel real good in the last couple of years, as far as where my well summers have landed, you know, we talked about some of the common faults, just narrow bodies, narrow heads. I don't really deal with that anymore. Just yeah. like we, we talked about the weights, you know, my males at 16 weeks are four and a half, five pounds. Awesome. My females are running between 3.3 .3 and 3.8 pounds. Yeah. And at 16 weeks, you know, the girls especially have filled out really nice. So some of the things that I see in my birds that I'm still fighting with a little bit, you know, early on, we had some feather chanks. Um, I think that's fairly common in the breed in terms of dealing with it. Um, I'm still fooling with toe tufts. I have not been able to breed entirely breed toe tufts out. Um, yeah. and you say I've that never, is you're, you're getting a little bit of some stubs between the toes. Correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. so it's a, it's, it's part of the selection criteria, but I, I haven't had, uh, probably, you know, good enough pens where, where I could say, you know, this out of this whole selection class, I'm, you know, I'm not going to breed anything with no tough or, you know, I can't keep everything with no tufts. I've still, I'm still looking at those. Um, you know, another, another thing that, uh, that people, you know, my conversations with other breeders, and fortunately, I don't experience it, is some white, you know, white tips on feathers. Um, I haven't seen that in my birds. Um, so, and I, I hope I never do. Yeah. But, uh, so, you know, those, I think the, I think the, the, uh, the feather shanks, the toe tufts, and the white feathers are probably the, the the things to be most you know most worried about yeah. once your once your birds are up to size and they're kind of the shape and type that you're yeah. looking for. So you have selectively bred, and again, I know I keep coming back to this to all of our listeners. Our theme and our commitment for responsible chicken breeding is you have to selectively breed. So Matt. I mean, from the very beginning of your well summers, every generation you are selecting for specific traits to improve those birds each generation, correct? Correct. And, and so one of the things I'm curious of, well, I was just going to ask that question is, is, um, you know, we want those dark eggs. Do you, do you see any variation in, in egg color and do you select for that? Have you, do you pay attention to that much? You know, go going back to that egg slide, there is some variation and I do select for egg color because I don't set any, I mean, I don't get too many, you know, really pale eggs, but if I see them, I don't set those, you know, I, I don't hatch those. Um, I'm obviously striving for the, for the eggs over on the left. Right. Um, you, you kind of see the variance from, from darkest to lightest. And, yeah. uh, I got you know, the birds I got initially were from Will Morrow and the egg color was pretty strong, although there was a lot of variation. Mm -hmm. Um, I will keep some lighter colored eggs if they've got the good dark speckling. Yeah. Um, pe yeah. people like those. And so that, that's kind of egg selection, but you know, with my birds, I kind of built the body first 
yeah. tried to get that tried to get that good dual purpose uh, type going and good vigor, and then all while trying to maintain that that good uh, that good egg color. And then yeah. probably the last things you know that I I really addressed were the combs and the overall color of the bird. Yeah. Well, if I remember correctly, birds that you placed, you always do a selection before I get there. But the birds that you placed for me to look at, there weren't very many bad combs, buddy. I mean, that's and that's kind of your point is you're cleaning those all out before, you know, before we do final selection, correct? Well, yeah. And one of the things that, uh, I mean, I look at these birds when they're 16 weeks old and initially, and the combs aren't necessarily that well developed in a lot of those birds when you do that. And then when, when you're coming to, you know, we're doing final selection, those birds are more like 26 to 30 weeks old. And in some cases, those combs have flourished and, and maybe to an extreme and, and maybe to the point where they knock the bird out. And so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but early on, I, I, didn't spend as much time and emphasize those as much. And so now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in the refinement process yeah, more so than the development process. And so yeah. which combs is awesome yeah. color color is a little tricky because these well summers is you probably remember are double mated. Yeah. And why so, don't you explain that? That's kind of a hard thing for people to wrap their head around, but explain it the best you can from, Matt Hemmer's perspective. What's that mean? Double mating. Well, you know, the two birds that I'm raising, the two breeds that I'm raising in the standard right now are salmon favorels and well summers. And wouldn't you know it, I managed to pick two breeds that are, that require double mating to get proper color. And so, you know, the well summers got accepted into the, into the standard in 1991. And there was a lot of show influence into that standard. And so when I say double mated, it means you, you literally have to have two lines of birds, one to get the right female color and another line to get the right male color. And you can't do both, which I mean, there's, a, I have a lot of good things to say about the standard and APA, but I, that's st that the standard as it's written for both of those breeds is really impractical. <laughs> and so I find myself having to make a choice or either, you know, splitting the difference in the middle yeah. with these birds. And I've kind of moved towards trying to get the hen color right and let the, and let the, uh, cockerel, let the male color kind of go where it. Yeah. Cause one of the things, if I remember, uh, on the male, on his breast, if it was, solid black that was bad for female breeding but it's what the standard says isn't that i get that right you know i spent a little time trying to straighten that we had that conversation with uh kurt burrows yeah and uh i think if you get a little more red in the in the breast of the male the better, yeah you get the better female color that's right that's exactly if you get that all black uh breast in the male which a lot of uh, standard calls for like 15% red yeah. flecking, but a lot of the show judges seem to prefer the all black breast. Yeah. And I think if, so if I think if you go that route, you end up with a little too much red color in the wings and the bow feathers on the females. Yeah. You're exactly so right. I have I that re backwards, but yeah, no, I think uh, you're refreshing my memory. I think that's, that's exactly right. And, and if I remember correctly in the early days, you had some, some narrow heads and kind of some crow heads. But now, I mean, I was looking at some of my pictures of your birds that I have and the heads, the last time I was there, the heads look, they're good, aren't they? Nice width and got some depth to them and good looking heads on the birds. Yeah. I mean, I really feel like, and, and last year was, a was, I raised out, um, some great birds on my property and I sent out a group to a neighbor farmer and he did a phenomenal job for with a late hatch and so i had lots of really nice birds it's it's so fun when you get the birds up on the table like you guys were talking about with the cages and you line them up and you're like well i could keep half of these and you know we come 
Well, you, you know, it's true. From, in the developmental stage, Jim, I was hatching 200 of these a year and to, you know, to keep 10 girls and, and three males. Yeah. And now, uh, I'm finally to the point where I, you know, I'm still hatching a hundred, but I get them up there. And once, you know, once we, once we put them on the scale and make sure they, they weigh appropriate weights, uh, we line them up and you're just kind of like, okay, we got to get really nitpicky to pick the yeah. top from the bottom. And that's just yeah, and, a, a really fun place just, to be. Yeah. And let me remind you, uh, you listeners and you, uh, those of you who are, are joining us, you remember Matt talked about hatching such large numbers. And what he just explained that you want to remember is you have anytime you're breeding any breed of chickens, you always have what we call variation. And variation means when Matt hatches a hundred well summers, about 10% of those are going to be the really good ones. And it'll, it'll have variation to, to the point where he'll be able to tell early on, I'm getting rid of these well summers because of X, Y, Z. And so the, you know, the more birds you hatch, the better off you are because you have more birds to select from. It's just like this guy in South Africa. He's got one buff Orpington male. Well, as Matt knows, he keeps multiple males for on his farm to breed. And so you really put yourself in a, in a, in a tough spot if you don't hatch enough birds to select from, because if Matt only hatched 25 well summers, he might go, I, you know, and, and 12 of those are males. Matt might say, well, I've got 12 males, but it's, and I don't like any of them, but I have to pick one of them because that's all I have. So hatching those numbers um, I mean, it's been a huge part. Not everybody can do that, but that's really been a part of your success, Matt. And, um, and I've been, a you know, I witnessed that. So you're at, I think you said that last week, you're hatching about a hundred of each breed now. Yeah, this, you know, this spring, um, I'm probably, I've probably hatched about 120 well summers. And so that'll be my, my selection pen yeah. that, that I'll be working towards. Um, yeah. Matt, yeah. talk to me, talk to me about, um, and, and I'm assuming, uh, uh, our producer, precious Karen, there is probably, she'll cut in whenever she wants, but I could talk chicken all day and Matt could too. So we might have a three hour show here. No. Um, what about white in the earlobes? Uh, how is that? Did you see a lot of that? Do you still see it? How do you address that? Do you allow it? Do you not allow it? Are you firm? Are you not firm? What do you say on the, on the earlobes? I haven't seen it. Oh, cool. And so I, you know, I don't, I get, I suppose somebody could maybe nitpick some of my pictures and I, I'd be embarrassed if they actually found something, you know, about the time you make a definitive statement, somebody goes, wait a minute. But, so, but in the beginning you saw it, right? I don't remember. I don't remember seeing it, Jim. Okay. Okay. Um, with, with the Will Morrow birds that I got early, I had a lot of variation in size especially mm -hmm. with the males. I had big birds, I had little birds. I had uh, birds that matured really early that stopped growing at about 12 weeks. And so, but it was a good base. You know, you, you, you brought up variation early on when you're developing birds, variation is your friend. Yeah. Later on, you want to breed against variation. Yeah, you want to exactly breed for right. consistency. So as, as you go through that journey, um, I mean, I feel like I made some, a lot of mistakes early on. I was, I was really flying by the seat of my pants the first couple generations before I, I got some actual, uh, training, mm -hmm. uh, courtesy of you. But, uh, and so uh, I, you know, I felt like I was, I could have, I could have wrecked some birds early on, but, uh, yeah. no, we, you know, the birds, the birds that we got from Will were, were nice overall birds. They were a little bit undersized. When we brought in uh, the birds from Karen, we got a little more size. We got a little more egg production from those. Um, I, you know, we also, I think, got the toe tufts from those birds. But, you know, that's all part of the process. And, and all the breeders will tell you, anytime you outcross, look out. Yeah. Um, if, in addition if I to remember what, you, correct, what you're looking for. You're welcome. For. 
And as anybody can guess, those slides with the uh, the uh, stubs all over them were from uh, my well summers that I uh, handed hey, off to Matt to clean hey, Karen, up. If I remember correctly, didn't your your mom and Ron take those? They they transported those birds all the way from North Carolina to Matt's house. Isn't that the way it went, Matt? Yeah. Oh yeah, they showed up in a big van full of chickens. It was quite the. Uh, road trip i think they vacationed in the ozarks on their way home oh that is and, so uh, cool it was a yeah it was it was a cool trip <laughs> and they, 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 that's what you call having a um and i forget how many birds did they bring you probably don't remember do you oh it had to be 30 wow i think it was that's close great. to 30 but you did say size we did benefit from those birds on size didn't we yeah one you know they they re they really helped beef up the size the overall size of the flock you That's know when great. i when i crossed them through they also were probably more productive in terms of uh overall egg production yeah. than the than the strain i was working with at the time they didn't quite have the the good egg color yeah um but those are all things you you know you 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 breed through those yeah. are all things you 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 work your way through and uh so yeah. you so you take the bump and you and you hatch a lot of birds and you and you call through them, so. Yeah. Well, I'm sure, Matt, maybe I'm going out on a limb here. Obviously, I mean, you're selling chicks. This is your, didn't you, you were at the post office today taking chicks to the, to that's send to why, somebody. That's why I'm in the second half of the show, because I was uh, <laughs> delivering chicks to the post office during the first half. And so you're still taking orders. You would, uh, you'd take orders for well summer babies, huh? Yeah, I hatch generally for sale. Uh, starting in uh, mid to late March and strong through April, May and into June. Um, out here in Kansas, you know, we're, we're uh, stuck with the weather we have. And so sometimes in June, it can get to 100, 110 degrees pretty quickly. And that's really hard on the birds. And so, you know, that's going to dictate when I'm done. But yeah. yes, I am, I am accepting orders and shipping chicks and have availability. Uh, you know, into, into May and into June right now still. And the other thing is, so they can go to your website, which is Smoky Beach Ranch, what, dot com? Correct. All right. And I'll go out on another limb here, all of you listeners and participants. Um, you know, Matt is a busy guy, but if you could send him an email and get a tour of his farm, he might not let you, but he won't say yes or no on here, but you would, you would, uh, his place is very cool. And so hopefully you're not bombarded with a bunch of visitor requests now, Matt. <laughs> I'm definitely open to farm tours. As Jim alluded to earlier, I love talking chickens. And so it's, yeah. uh, it's a lot of fun and I enjoy having visitors. It's, this is a really busy time of year, but, uh, yeah, it it's, it's pretty much all about chickens. We're, yeah. we're kind of chickens. You and know. when does, does your heat really kick in in June? It can, yeah. uh, when the, when the heat matures and the whole countryside turns golden, um, we can get some really high temperatures and, yeah. uh, that really shuts a lot of birds off from a production standpoint yeah. or, you know, and fertility and hatch rates tend to drop. And so that's when I'm kind of done. Yeah. Um, last year I shipped chicks all the way to the 29th of June, wow. but, uh, you know, we'll just, we'll see. Yeah. Karen, what were you thinking? Uh, what, what are you, uh, what's this slide helping well, us to do here? I just wanted to promote Matt's a member of the well summer club of North America. So I just thought I'd put that up for anybody else who wants to join. I think it's actually free this year. Um, but don't take my word for it. Figure that out. I um, believe you're right, Karen. Um, and we had a listener help us or, remind me recently that the American Poultry Association is not the only chicken organization and that we maybe needed to be open a little bit to other organizations and other standards. Um, so they reminded me that there was a, a white New Hampshire chicken that is recognized in many countries and has a use even here in the United States for meat purposes. Um, so I just want to say the American Poultry Association only um, recognizes one variety of well summer, which I believe would be called like the part, like the red partridge. Is that right? That's correct. 
All right. Um, and then the American Bantam Association, however, does do two colors. They call the first one well summer plumage, which was not helpful for me because they didn't <laughs> tell me what. <laughs> um, but then they called the second variety for the Bantams uh, silver duck wing. Yeah. And um, I'll tell you, she mentioned that to me uh, backstage. And I'm like, I've been judging for 40 years. I have never judged a silver duck wing well summer. Now, it's in the standard. Great. I'd love for They're summers. really rare. Yeah. yeah. They're really, yeah. really rare. Um, I mean, well, and it's not I, in even in the Bantams American Poultry Association Bantams. It's not part of the standard. So I guess, the, but in the ABA, it is. So I don't know what at that. Germany and Great Britain and France have like all kinds of colors. Oh, but in the country of origin, not only did they change the name to make it more authentic and took the second M out, but they very, very, very much only want the right well summer color. So that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Matt, I, uh, man, I, I, I was envying last week having to, uh, not being able to be on the show live with you. And, um, I just, uh, it's, it's great having you on here and you are, um, uh, to me, a, a, I know you're not a perfect breeder, uh, by any stretch no of the such thing, is there? You no. Know, and you're learning and learning and learning, but, uh, I constantly applaud what you're doing and, and, um, COVID has caused me not to be able to come your way for a year or two or, and, uh, but you are doing a great job and, and, uh, we're very honored to have you on the show for two weeks in a row. So, um, and well, we will you. have you back. You know, I, I love the Ermanettes and, uh, I, um, we got to really, I, I love listening to you last week and just some of the things that continue to develop with that. And so, um, thank you so much for, adjusting your day to be with us that I I'm very grateful. And Karen, is there anything else we need to wrap yeah. up? With Mr. Well, Matt? One, one, I want to play the breed summary video because I made it. So you have to watch it. Um, <laughs> um, and I want to give Matt a half a chance here, Matt, will you be talking about the Erminets anywhere else that people might be able to catch you? If you, <laughs> well, <laughs> as a matter of fact, Karen, <laughs> Kenny Triano has asked me to join him to talk about Erminette breeding. And so I'm not sure when we're going to get that done, but I've committed to do that and cool. another opportunity to talk chickens. Amen. That's All awesome. Right. All right, everybody. Yeah. So I'm actually going to play the summary video and then we're going to go ahead and head out because I got to get to work. So Matt, <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks, you guys. This was All a right. lot of fun. Great. Thanks, we'll see Matt. you next time. You bet.